Hello, and welcome to a very special podcast that is part of a series I'm leading on diversity and inclusivity with CME Outfitters. Today's CMEO briefcase is entitled Racial Disparities in Melanoma Care, Steps to Improve Care. Today's activity is supported by an educational grant from the Johnson & Johnson Institute and the Johnson & Johnson Family of Camp Companies. I'm Dr. Monica Peek, and I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Andrew Alexis. Dr. Alexis, I'm honored to have you with us today, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Thank you. Great. Uh, let me begin by starting our first learning objective, which is to implement the best practices to improve melanoma morbidity and mortality rates in patients of color. But first, I want to start by asking you, the audience, to give us your input on this first question. What is the five-year survival rate for Black people with melanoma versus white people with this uh, very same skin cancer? Is it A, 15% versus 25%? B, 27% versus 50%, C, 73% versus 93%, D, 95% versus 77%, or E, I have no idea, <laughs> I'm not sure. So we'll give you a few minutes to log in your answers. I remember we're comparing black people um, to white people. So the, black, the first number is for African-Americans, the second number is for whites. All right, well, the correct answer was uh, C, 73% to 93%. And looked like we had a, a very sort of uh, widespread of answers. So um, we have room to grow uh, <laughs> with uh, today's session. Um, I think that what we see at least is that um, a lot of people felt that there were disparities in that uh, there were lower survival rates um, for African-Americans. Um, and so if we look at those uh, lower versus higher, the majority of people said probably lower uh, survival rates of five years. Um, Dr. Alexis, do you have uh, any other comments about this, this audience response? Yeah, I, I think you hit it right on the head, Dr. Peek, and that is that the audience, uh, the vast majority of the audience um, selected a response that conveys that the five-year survival rate for Black populations compared to white populations is lower. And so the directionality was, was clearly um, there for it in the minds of most of our audience. It turns out, using the latest data from, from SEER, uh, this is from 2005 to uh, 2009 data uh, from the SEER database, turns out the answer is C, where the uh, five-year survival for Black patients in the United States is 73% versus 93% for melanomas and whites in the U.S. So, All right. Um, and I, th I think it's probably good news overall that the survival rates are not as low as the, you know, 15 to 50 percent. Um, so, Dr. Alexis, I know that you've uh, researched disparities in dermatologic care extensively, including melanoma, which is a much lower incidence in patients of color, yet a two to three fold increased risk of mortality for these populations. What can you tell us about the immense gap in outcomes for the skin cancer? Yes, as you said, Dr. Peek, when it comes to melanoma, uh, when we look at, when we compare different racial ethnic populations, we see differences in the, in the incidence and prevalence of melanoma. And in broad strokes, melanoma is indeed less prevalent in populations with skin of color. However, when it does occur in the various non-white racial ethnic groups, um, we see that uh, melanoma is more likely to be diagnosed at a later stage. We see that the five, five year and 10 year survival rates are lower uh, than compared to whites. And uh, a number of other issues that we're gonna touch on in the, in, over the course of uh, tonight's program. Excellent. Um, the, I'm always fascinated with the lower incidence, higher mortality. We see that in breast cancer also. And so, uh, digging deeper to find out the reasons for this is always really, really important. Um, maybe you can uh, walk us through this next slide. Sure. So picking up on that same theme of um, 
disparities in melanoma outcomes uh, by um, uh, self-identified racial ethnic group. Uh, we talked about the five-year survival rate differences. Um, and uh, as far as trying to drill down into why would there be differences in, in survival and melanoma outcomes? And the answer is complex and multifactorial, but we do have uh, some ideas as to why this might be. And one of them is that uh, melanomas tend to be diagnosed at a later stage in patients of color than in white patients. Specifically, when we look at Black or African-American patients, we see that later stage of melanoma is considerably higher at the time of diagnosis compared to, to white patients. Uh, and we'll talk about why that might be, what might contribute to these uh, uh, delays in, in diagnosis. Why would it be diagnosed at later stages? Um, on the bottom half of the slide where you see these curves, um, this comes from, uh, from, from a study published back in 2016, I believe, where, where um, the authors stratified uh, race uh, and stage of melanoma and found that Black patients had significantly lower survival rates for stages one and three compared to white patients. So the red curve represents white patients and survival in months, whereas the black curve below it represents uh, black patients. And particularly for stages one and three, we see statistically significantly um, lower rates of survival in black patients compared to white patients. So what, one of the questions that uh, has come in already, and you may get to this later on, um, and so, so we can just say, put a pin in it. Um, <laughs> but what is the role of the primary care provider, like me, um, in helping to identify risks and to screen for melanoma in patients of color? That's a great question. I think the primary care uh, physician can play a critical role uh, in um, reducing these, uh, uh, these disparities uh, by, by, uh, playing some role in education as far as um, overcoming the misconception that patients with skin of color do not get skin cancers. Unfortunately, that's a widely held uh, myth or misconception among uh, communities of color. And so educating uh, our patients that anyone of any uh, skin type can get skin cancers, even though the, the prevalences may be uh, lower. And when they do occur, um, they tend to occur in different anatomic locations or have different clinical appearances. So it's important that any new or changing uh, mole or growth or spot um, is, uh, is evaluated to ensure uh, that it's not um, a, uh, a cutaneous malignancy. So having a low threshold to refer to a specialist in the context of a new or changing growth and empowering, helping to empower our patients to perform self skin exams, to be able to be knowledgeable about what is their baseline. And so they can be in a position to detect new or changing lesions. Thank you. Very helpful and excellent question. Um, we see across the board in healthcare disparities that disease types that are more common in people of color are termed rare and may not be given enough attention. Uh, Dr. Alexis, let's talk about a subtype of melanoma that is more common in skin of color and how it may present differently than other types of skin cancer and even melanomas. Yes, absolutely. So when it comes to, when we look at melanomas as a whole, in comparing patients, patient populations with skin of color versus uh, white populations of European ancestry. And we look at the different subtypes of melanoma. So there's multiple different subtypes as most of the audience will, will, will be aware of, superficial spreading melanoma, nodular melanoma, lentigo maligna, and acrolentigenous melanoma. So these are these histo histologic subtypes of melanoma. And when we look at the breakdown of these different melanoma subtypes by population, what we see is that in populations with richly pigmented skin, such as black populations, um, Asian populations, um, and uh, in some subsets of the Hispanic Lat uh, Lat Latino populations, we see that uh, the most common subtype is the acrolentigenous melanoma subtype. And that is the type that involves 
the, as the name impl implies, um, the uh, glabrous skin of the palms, soles, and the nail unit. So this is the most common subtype that we see in patients of color, whereas in white patients, uh, that, uh, that is uh, a much, represents a much smaller proportion of melanomas. The most common subtype of melanoma in white patients would be superficial spreading. So whereas acral lentiginous melanoma makes up a very small proportion in lighter skin populations, it makes up the largest proportion of all melanomas in populations of color. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. So this slide you know, it conveys the, the um, just illustrates uh, one of the comments I made earlier about when it comes to skin cancers in general, when it comes to skin cancers and skin of, skin of color populations, although the prevalence uh, is lower, um, there are variations uh, in the anatomic uh, location that these uh, skin cancers are found, as well as differences in, uh, in morphology. So briefly, um, we see that when it comes to squamous cell carcinomas, for example, uh, sun protected, relatively sun protected areas uh, are more likely to, um, um, uh, to have uh, squamous cell carcinomas in uh, populations of skin of color. So the lower extremities, the genital areas, uh, for example. When it comes to melanoma, uh, we see differences in anatomic distribution across populations and the sole of the foot, palms of the, the hand, the nail unit are more likely locations in darker skin populations uh, um, as far as where one a melanoma would be found. Much less likely to find a melanoma in uh, intermittently and chronically sun-exposed areas in black patients. When it comes to a population like his, the Hispanic Latino population, which is across the board, Fitzpatrick types one to six, very diverse, very heterogeneous group, there we, we're going to see a lot more variation in terms of uh, melanomas occurring in sun-exposed areas versus sun-protected areas. Excellent, very fascinating. Um, so let's let's take a look at some patient cases um, that illustrate the disparate care in melanoma and what should be done to provide optimal and equitable care to improve melanoma outcomes in individuals of color. But first, we're going to take a, a break to ask our audience another question and see how we're doing here clinically. Which of the following strategies may help to increase the detection of melanomas in non-white populations? So A, targeted screening of areas of the body exposed to UV radiation, B, focused examination of the trunk and face for lesions that may be malignant, C, close inspection of the palms, soles, nails, and muc mucous membranes, D, targeted skin examinations directed by patient history, and then always E, I have no idea, <laughs> I'm not sure. So we'll give a few minutes to see how closely you were listening to the previous slide. Slides. Uh. All right. There we go. <laughs> 60%. Close inspection of the palms, soles, nails, and mucous membranes. Uh, Dr. Alexis, do you have anything else to add? That warms my heart. <laughs> The audience is really on point. Excellent. Um, all right, Dr. Lex, as you mentioned, the ALM is a type of melanoma that is more common in skin of color. Tell us about our patient, um, Miss Mary Davis, who is a 73-year-old nurse and was diagnosed when she happened to see a dermatologist for a facial mole that was determined to be benign. What does this case further teach us about how melanoma can present in people of color and how this may differ from other types of melanoma? Yeah, this, this is a case that um, resonates with me in that I frequently see patients with skin of color who may come in with a chief complaint of a, of a, of a lesion that is in a very highly visible area, let's say on the face or on the, on the chest or the arm. And it might just be a seborrheic keratosis or another benign lesion, but it's only when uh, insisting on conducting a full body skin exam, or at the very least, 
looking at the palm cells, uh, nail units, and mucous membranes, that we, from time to time, will uncover a malignant lesion that the patient had no idea was there, or, or, or at least wasn't going to bring up during the visit. And, and this is uh, uh, what this case illustrates here. And this, is, this picture here is a picture of, of one such patient of mine from, from, uh, from my clinic a number of years ago, which was the exact same story of, of uh, something on the face, but uh, only when I insisted on doing a complete skin exam and having her uh, take off her stockings and actually expose her feet, um, did we find this uh, very suspicious uh, pigmented lesion, um, which of course is a melanoma. So uh, this was biopsied and uh, did come back as the acral antigenous melanoma subtype uh, as expected. Um, and it was further excised and she actually did well, thankfully. Um, so acral antigenous melanoma as a, a sort of beating a dead horse, but really driving it home that is, it is the most common subtype among populations of color, including Asian populations and populations of African descent. There's also other populations around the world, including Middle Eastern populations where it's been reported to be among the more common subtypes. In general, the richly pigmented skin tones, this, they'll be less likely to have melanomas in the uh, sun exposed areas and more likely to have uh, this particular type ALM. The problem here is this is an area that is often, you know, it's it's the surveillance rate of the of these places that are usually covered is much lower than in areas that are more exposed, um, and so there's a tendency for these to be diagnosed at later stages. They are thicker at the time of the di of diagnosis. There might be ulceration and other poor prognostic factors. Whether the biological behavior of these differs is something that is, is, is not quite clear, but it's possible that biologic behavior differences between melanoma subtypes also contribute to the differences in outcomes. Excellent. So as you just mentioned, unlearning is one of the key words in healthcare dispar disparities. Um, what are some of the skin cancer screening strategies that we can implement, particularly for diagnosing melanoma in people of color? Yeah, so um, I think that the real take home message is that um, in any examination that is intended to screen for melanoma, to include, and this is for any patient of any background, but it's particularly important for patients of color uh, to include a thorough examination of the palms, the soles, and the nail, the nail unit. What does that mean, thorough? Um, part that you actually have to separate uh, the digits, look between the digits too, look at the soles, uh, look at the nail unit completely, um, make sure that this is a, a priority within in the context of a complete skin exam. Um, when it comes to patient uh, uh, education, this is important too, patients don't know what to look for. You know, if, if, if all the the, uh, the educational materials show uh, skin cancers in sun-exposed areas and don't include uh, one on the foot, they, they're not going to really know to, to look there. Um, so risk factors for melanomas on the feet are less clear, whereas melanomas uh, in uh, intermittently sun-exposed and chronically sun-exposed areas the risk factor of UV is very, very clear. When it comes to a site like the sole of the foot, uh, it's less clear what the, what the risk factors are. Genetic factors uh, likely play a role. Mechanical trauma has been proposed as a potential factor. In fact, there is, uh, there is a study that shows that the actual location of, of, uh, of melanomas on acral surfaces seem to be more frequently at pressure points. So this, this suggests that maybe mechanical trauma plays a role. Something very interesting is that there, are, um, uh, there appear to be distinct genetic signatures for melanomas that arise on acral sites versus those that arise on intermittently sun-exposed areas, for example. Uh, in fact, uh, lower rates of mutations in BRAF and NRAS genes uh, in acral melanomas have been observed compared to melanomas, uh, cutaneous melanos melanomas in non-glabrous skin. So would these uh, genetic markers be something that would 
who, who would be testing for these? Um, so it, it's, um, it wouldn't be the standard of care to be testing for these genetic um, markers, with the exception of some, if, if a patient is a candidate for specific uh, targeted therapies, it does depend on whether they have um, um, specific mutations, whether they'd be a candidate for uh, one of these therapies. So in that context, that's when genetic testing uh, becomes relevant in the clinical okay. setting. One uh, question that I'll ask um, before we move on to our next case is, are there other healthcare professionals um, that are trained to screen for melanoma in darker skin tones, like nurses? They're, um, not all areas of the country, not all areas of the world have an abundance of physicians, um, even primary care physicians. And um, given, you know, the a preponderance of people of color um, and the sort of shortage of healthcare manpower, people power, um, do we have other tools in place to make sure that our education is going um, deep enough into the bench to help everyone be able to identify these? I think that uh, you touch on a very important point. I mean, there's, um, there are um, parts of the country where um, access to a physician, whether it's a primary care physician or a specialist like a dermatologist, very limited. And so to the extent that we can um, have others, uh, other members of the healthcare provider team, such as nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, uh, and others to help in screening efforts, I think that would be beneficial. Um, and that's, that does vary from, from by geographic region. I think that's something that we could do a better job of. Great. Well, let's move on to our next patient case, Mr. Henry Chavez, a 56-year-old landscaping professional who's an example of how UV radiation can also affect people with darker skin tones. Um, Dr. Alexis, walk us through this case and some of the social and structural determinants of health that may impact melanoma care. Sure. So this case is a 56-year-old Hispanic man. He is, his, his work, his line of work involves outdoor exposure. So he's in landscaping. Um, he, and he presents to the dermatologist after his wife noticed a lesion on his back. And that's a common scenario where, where the spouse or partner may notice uh, something, particularly in an area that's harder for an individual to see, like the back. And what uh, triggered it is a change in shape and color. Um, the patient notes that he often gets sun exposure in his line of work, but uh, doesn't uh, use sunscreen, doesn't feel he needs sunscreen because the skin rarely burns. And I think that's a really, uh, that's a common theme uh, that, that I also see in my patients and is reflected in the literature um, that populations with skin of color are less likely to use um, sunscreens and, and, uh, and perceive a risk of, sun, of skin cancer uh, and therefore may not practice sun protective behaviors uh, uh, for that reason. So the lesion was biopsied and uh, Mr. Chavez was diagnosed with a melanoma um, and uh, uh, of note with respect to his medical history and medications, uh, because he's a hypertensive, he is actually on a thiazide uh, diuretic. And uh, that's uh, an interesting uh, factor in that thiazide diuretics uh, might be associated with an increased risk for, for skin cancers and certainly do increase uh, uh, photosensitivity. Interesting. Um, so this reminds me that another question had come in similarly about the nursing issue, um, but what about the role of pharmacists in education? And so for this patient, there was not only the medication history, but also the sort of UV protectants. And so there's more and more of a, a call for pharmacists to be involved in clinical care teams, but also for a community pharmacists as they're helping patients um, not only uh, manage their prescriptions, but guiding them to various things that are in the pharmacy itself. Um, might there be a role for them in, um, in doing patient education um, as they're you know, interacting with patients around some of these issues? That's a very interesting suggestion, Dr. Peek. Uh, one that I had not considered actually, but yeah, I think that there is an opportunity there for com community pharmacists to assist in in um, uh, 
education of, of patients with respect to um, sun protective uh, products like sunscreens. All right, uh, do you wanna walk us through the next slide? Sure, so this slide does include some of the themes that I already touched on. So in an effort not to be too repetitive, I'll just sort of gloss over some of this data. Let's go to the bottom of the slide uh, where I think this is an interesting uh, bullet that's highlight, highlighted here. And that is that uh, we see lower, there's data to, to suggest that uh, patients of color are less likely to have a complete uh, skin exam, a total body skin exam uh, by a physician uh, compared to white patients. Uh, and uh, in addition to just the, the lower utilization of sunscreen and sun protective behavior, um, when it comes to advice given by their healthcare provider, uh, patients of color um, uh, have, um, uh, are less likely to be recommended a sunscreen or prescribed a sunscreen by their uh, health healthcare provider. Um, and you can see the data there. So I think that uh, the lower um, utilization of sunscreen and sun protective behavior is in part due to widely held misconceptions among communities of color that um, Darker skin doesn't really need protection. It doesn't, maybe not as, not really at risk of skin cancer, but also on the part of the healthcare pro provider community in that um, recommendations for sunscreen are just not, not being made and full body skin exams are just not being done um, to the same, same extent. Great. In your experience, what are some of the clinical diagnostic features and tools uh, to best screen melanomas in darker skin tones? Yeah, so one of the um, uh, one of the most useful tools uh, in uh, early detection of, me of melanoma is dermoscopy. Now, of course, this is something for uh, primarily for dermatologists, uh, but uh, dermoscopy is a is a wonderful non-invasive uh, technique for being able to differentiate uh, benign from malignant. Uh, 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 pigmented lesions. Um, beyond that, beyond the tool of derm dermoscopy, patient education, informing patients of what to look for and where to look uh, for, uh, for melanoma and other skin cancers. Um, there clearly is a gap with respect to education as far as knowing that uh, places like the, the soles of the feet and the nail uh, are uh, common sites for melanoma in patients of color. I can tell you how, you know, time and time again, when I insist on examining the feet of, of my patients, they often will look at me uh, strange, look at me funny and not understand why I'm doing that. And so I've gotten into the routine where I, as I'm doing that, I explain why am I looking here? And I explain that this is an area that, uh, um, that can um, um, be susceptible to melanoma. And when melanomas do occur in patients of color, this is where they're more likely to be found. And um, nine times out of 10, my patients are, tell me that that's the first time they've heard that, they weren't aware. Um, and so it tells me that there's a lot of patient education to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned just recently that that's how Bob Marley died that's from right. a melanoma in his toenail. That's so. right. I, um, I have thought about that more in the patient education that I do, because everyone knows Bob Marley, everyone knows he died early. Um, and so I, that is something that I'm going to sort of help use to motivate my patients in thinking about screening. I agree. That's very useful. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, someone had, that was actually, someone put that in the, uh, <laughs> Someone just put that also as a question. He had a toe melanoma. So yes, um, there were two questions that came up about screening. Um, one question uh, someone asked about, do they heard that the, the sunscreen products actually caused cancer? And is there any truth to that? And then another person said, um, how are you going to get your vitamin D if you're using all that sunscreen? Um, and that they like to have their vitamin D sort of naturally activated from the sun instead of using supplements. And so what do you, what do you tell people that? Okay, that first question about whether sunscreens might actually cause skin cancer, um, the, the evidence does not support that statement. Um, on the contrary, sunscreens um, can be 
uh, helpful in preventing skin cancer. So I'm not, I, I don't think there's any com compelling evidence to suggest that we're increasing the risk of skin cancer by using uh, sunscreens. <coughs> second, uh, bless you. The second question, um, could you kindly remind me of the second question? Oh, if people are trying to get their vitamin D on through the sun. <laughs> Great question about the vitamin D. Yes, it's, it is a, it's a, a common question. Um, and so what, what I tell my patients is to uh, depend on oral supplementation um, uh, for vitamin D as opposed to exposing the skin to a, a risk factor for skin cancer, but not even just only skin cancer, a, a number of other skin concerns that are, that are relevant to, to, to all patients and some that are sp very specifically relevant to skin of color. So sun exposure accelerates photo aging, the skin aging uh, process, and that's something that everyone can relate to. But specifically to patients of color, pigmentary uh, disorders of hyperpigmentation are exacerbated by, by UV exposure. And that's something that's of great concern to many patients with, with skin of color. So lots of reasons to protect the skin from the sun. And with respect to the vitamin D concern, it can be safely and effectively um, addressed by oral supplementation. Great. Do you like to walk us through this last slide? Sure. So I, I commented on the utility of dermoscopy, and it becomes, it's very relevant in this context of here we are, we've emphasized so much about you've got to look at the palms and soles and nails. But the thing is that um, pigmented lesions, um, uh, benign pigmented lesions are, are, are very common uh, in, in patients of color. And so how do you differentiate what, what is benign uh, from what is malignant? And, and uh, it's not always so easy. And dermoscopy can be very helpful in differentiating. And some takeaways, key takeaways from, from this slide, I'm just gonna highlight one, uh, one concept and that is the parallel furrow pattern, uh, which is shown on the um, top left, um, is, uh, is a benign feature. Whereas the parallel ridge pattern on dermoscopy is suspicious and highly uh, specific uh, for acral melanomas. In addition to that, you can see that on the right, the malignant one, it's asymmetric, it's disorganized, the, the color is variegated. There's a lot of things, even grossly, even without dermoscopy, that suggest that this is a melanoma as opposed to a benign lesion, which would be more symmetrical, uniform, sharply demarcated, et cetera. Great. So let's turn to our last patient, uh, Mr. Malcolm Baker. He's a 34-year-old IT professional who presents with melanoma of the nail bed. Dr. Alexis, please introduce to us this patient and the type of skin cancer, uh, which was perhaps first brought to the attention of the wider public when Bob Marley, a person of color, was diagnosed with nail melanoma. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Baker here, 34-year-old man, works primarily indoors. He's an IT professional. Um, so uh, not primarily, exclusively indoors. Um, and he presents to the dermatologist uh, um, with uh, discoloration of the nail uh, on the big toe. It's, it's changed. He suspects it's a fungal infection uh, and uh, or related to uh, uh, stubbing of the toe. Um, and uh, bottom line is uh, uh, it was suspicious clinically and biopsied and, and uh, diagnosed as a subungual melanoma. Perhaps in the next slide, we can elaborate a little further. Sure, um, but before we do, <laughs> uh, let's poll the audience with a related question. Important clinical features of nail or subungual melanoma, SUM, include which of the following? A, primarily occur in adults and young adults, I'm sorry, adolescents and young adults. B, multiple nails with uniformly brown, well-demarcated linear bands in an individual with richly pigmented skin. C, with a pigmentation that is equal to or more than two thirds of the nail plate. D, linear brown bands that are less than three millimeters in width. Or E, I'm not sure, I have no idea. All right, let's hit the pleasant music and let people decide.
All right. So um, the answer was C, uh, with the pigmentation that is equal to or more than two thirds of the nail plate. And although that wasn't uh, overwhelming majority, at least that was the, the, the highest group that chose that answer. Dr. Alexis, do you wanna uh, give any commentary? Sure, and um, in the slides that follow, we'll talk about why the answer, the correct answer is what it is. Um, but um, um, going to some of those other responses that uh, turned out to be incorrect, you know, when, when one has brown bands on the nails, and has uh, darker pigmentation. So someone with uh, higher Fitzpatrick type, richly pigmented skin with multiple nails involved with linear brown bands, that's actually a reassuring sign, multiple nails involved in someone with uh, richly pigmented skin. That is common, a common benign variant of, uh, of a benign melanonychia, but not melanoma. Uh, going down to one of the responses there, linear brown bands that are less than three millimeters in width. That's actually a positive uh, uh, finding, a reassuring finding when it's less than three millimeters in width as opposed to greater. But we'll elaborate further on some with some of the other information that we're going to show. Great. So you want to dive right in and tell us more about the clinical features of nail melanoma? Sure. And these images here shown on the right are from a, from a close colleague of mine at Cornell named uh, Dr. Sherry Lipner. She's a uh, renowned nail uh, expert, a dermatologist with expertise in nail. And this, these, these, those represent her images. And I think they're very illustr uh, um, illustrative of what we should be looking for in terms of detecting subugual melanomas. Um, you'll see that, uh, let's look at that top picture there, that there, there are these multiple streaks within the band, the brown band uh, on this nail. And if one looks carefully at the width of the brown band proximally versus distally, it appears that the width is a little bit wider uh, proximally versus distally, and that's an atypical feature. If it should be uniform in width all the way down the length of the, uh, of the nail in the benign variant. There is also um, um, the extension of pigment onto the proximal uh, nail fold, which is called Hutchinson sign. In this case, maybe it's not that visible grossly, but it is visible on dermoscopy, uh, and that's called micro Hutchinson sign uh, when one can detect it that way. Um, I mentioned width. Uh, it's been shown that width less than three millimeters is generally associated with uh, most of the benign lesions, but a width greater than three millimeters of the band or if involvement of at least two thirds of the nail plate should raise one's uh, 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 level of uh, suspicion for melanoma. Excellent. This here shows a, a nice, a helpful um, mnemonic uh, guide for um, what to look for in nail melanomas. It's called the A, B, C, D, E's, and F of uh, nail melanomas, uh, published uh, originally published a number of years ago by, from Columbia University. And A stands for age of patient. It most commonly presents in the um, uh, after the fifth decade of life, but can certainly occur at younger age groups. B uh, stands for band, and the band should be uniform in color, not with variegation in, in, in pigment and breadth of greater than three millimeters or having irregular or blurred borders would be suspicious. Change, any change in the size, the color, the shape should be suspicious. The digit of involvement, the thumb, the great toe, the index finger tend to be more frequently involved. Extension of the pigment, that's E, onto the nail fold or uh, uh, the perionychium called Hutchinson sign we talked about in family history for F, a personal or family history of melanoma uh, would uh, also be a factor to consider in risk stratification when examining the nails. Great. Now, it's been so important um, to um, diagnose these uh, early as uh, um, uh, the treatment for uh, invasive uh, 
melanomas of the nail unit can include uh, amputation of, of the of the digit. Um, and so, um, the, you know, the consequences of, uh, of having this uh, uh, are, are quite great. Um, and so, uh, yes, very important to uh, uh, employ efforts that will result in early detection. So one of the things that we haven't yet talked about is uh, structural inequities or structural racism and how that feeds the social determinants of health that are partly responsible for disparities in access to care. And someone actually had just asked about some of the macro level factors related to melanoma care disparities like insurance status. So Dr. Alexis, how does access impact melanoma outcomes and what are some of the ways that we as healthcare professionals can overcome these deep rooted barriers to equitable care and skin cancer? Yes, uh, as, as you touched on, there are a number of non-biologic reasons why the, why the prognosis, the outcome of uh, melanomas in populations of color are, are worse than in white patients. Uh, one of these non-biologic factors is access to care, including insurance type. Um, there, there are data published in the literature that show um, that having Medicaid insurance as compared to commercial or private insurance is associated with later stage of diagnosis and treatment. On the other hand, not shown here, but a recent study looked at states that have expanded Medicaid programs versus those that don't. And, and uh, when looking at that comparison, uh, states that have expanded Medicaid actually had uh, a lower frequency of late stage melanomas than those that had more limited Medicaid coverage. So uh, some coverage like public insurance with Medicaid is still better than, no, than, than less coverage. But when comparing Medicaid to commercial, um, there, there, is a, there appears to be a disparity in terms of uh, stage of diagnosis and delays or time to surgery. Once the diagnosis is made, uh, when is a, a, a surgical excision performed? And there appear to be differences with prolonged uh, intervals from diagnosis to surgery in Medicaid compared to private. Um, when uh, dermatologists uh, are involved, or when, particularly when dermatologists and the primary care physician are involved, we see uh, lower mortality rates than when, um, uh, when there's an absence of, uh, of um, dermatologic care. So how can we improve the care of melanoma and skin of color? You know, we presented uh, these, these disparities, which are alarming and, and, uh, and, and certainly deserve um, uh, close attention and, and work to, uh, to resolve. So how can we do this? What can we do? Let's start with things that we can do even at the individual level. So improved education on how uh, the, the diversity of how what melanomas actually present, the way they present, the clinical manifestations of melanomas across diverse patient populations. So arming ourselves with, the, with, the, with robust uh, educational materials so we can recognize, better recognize what do melanomas look like when they uh, present across uh, a broad range of different populations so we can be better at detecting them. Improving patient education uh, at the individual level and then broadly with at the at lo uh, large organization and, and public education campaigns. Research, uh, further research into understanding potential differences in the uh, genetics and biologic behavior of uh, melanomas between populations and melanomas between different sites, acral sites versus non-acral sites, et cetera, all areas where um, um, work is being done and needs and more work needs to be done in order to help reduce these disparities. One thing, I, one question I just wanted to ask, or is do you know if, and this, this is a question coming from the audience, has publication, public education been done at nail salons? Because so many of my patients come in with their nails already done. I may never see their nail beds except for their toenails. And so, um, and sometimes even the toenails are done, you know, and so having informational handouts with pictures like you just showed us, uh, particularly for the nail beds, you know, that might be an excellent avenue for 
for patients as are in the nail salon for nail technologists, um, you know, where people are actually having maybe a greater opportunity than physicians to see the naked nail bed um, more frequently than we do. Do you know if that's ever been done? And Yeah, I smiled when you said that because it's something that I think about often, um, but I'm not aware of any uh, I'm not aware of any campaigns that have targeted um, uh, or worked with nail salons, but I think it's a fantastic idea. I think that it's something that uh, um, I hope to uh, uh, to either work on personally or or at least uh, uh, promote the idea of that that kind of engagement. I think that would go a long way in terms of getting to the communities that we that we're speaking of. Um, so. Great idea. Thank you, audience member. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Alexis, you noted earlier that uh, healthcare disparities include exclusion from research trials and some best practice gu guidelines. How is this true in melanoma care and what can we do to help mitigate this? Yeah, so we know um, that there are um, disparities in, in clinical research across the board, across the entire house of medicine. Dermatology is no exception, uh, that when we look at uh, the breakdown of, of subjects enrolled in cl clinical trials and uh, in dermatologic research in general, we do see underrepresentation of, in particular, Black or African-American patients, but others with skin of color too. Um, a lot of this is, due, we don't have time to go into all the reasons, but we, they're it does include mistrust, historic, longstanding mistrust in the medical community. But one factor that, that's, that's something that is actionable and it's important to think about is being able to engage with, with diverse patient populations, uh, being able to get the word out about the, uh, what is clinical research and why is it potentially beneficial and how can you get involved, getting those messages out actually out to the community level. Because um, I do find that there are disparities in just basic understanding of what is clinical research. I constantly hear the response, oh, I don't want to be a guinea pig in quotation marks. So clearly there are misconceptions of what that really means. And I think with better education about what clinical trials are and how they may be beneficial, um, it, it would improve um, the diversity of, of enrollment. One area where this becomes very relevant to melanoma is artificial intelligence. So there are a lot of uh, entities uh, working on artificial intelligence to improve diagnosis of melanoma. Uh, the, the quality of these systems are dependent on how inclusive the, the, uh, the, the images that are used to train the, the augmented in, in intelligence platform. So if there's limited inclusion of melanomas uh, in skin of color, well, then the uh, accuracy of, of these uh, approaches is going to be limited. So that's, that's really a, a big issue that needs to, to be addressed. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for, for pointing that out. I know we've already covered this, um, but maybe you can just give one last shout out um, and, and points to make about sun protection, sun exposure, and skin of color. Sure, absolutely. So even though we've talked about some of these melanomas that occur in sun protected sites like the soles of the feet, that's not to say that melanomas and other skin cancers don't occur in the exposed areas. And so sun exposure, uh, sun, sun protection is recommended for patients of all skin types. And the AAD has uh, published guidelines for um, sun protection skin of color and does include uh, recommending broad spectrum sunscreen with SPF of 30 or greater to populations uh, uh, of all types, including those of skin of color. The vitamin D issue was raised already, so I won't repeat it, but that's often one of the, the, the concerns about our sunscreen recommendations. Other types of uh, uh, benefits of sun protection, particularly for patients with skin of color, is, is prevention and even improvement of melasma and other disorders of hyperpigmentation and uh, prevention of photoaging. So thank you so much, Dr. Alexis. And we've uh, been getting comments about great presentation. Thank you so much. 
This has been a wonderful time having you here. This has just been really insightful. I've learned a lot. <laughs> um, and I hope everyone else who's been watching has well. Um, it's been just really uh, informational and inspiring on how to learn more about melanoma um, and how to mitigate disparities in this for people of color. Um, and just to summarize uh, this program, our SMART goals uh, for each of us who's watching to, to keep in mind um, are number one, to improve awareness of racial disparities in melanoma outcomes and to address healthcare provider biases in screening and management of melanoma for skin of color. Uh, two, to integrate best practices and to account for structural racism and barriers in the screening, diagnosis, and treatment of melanoma in people of color. And last is to develop sustainable models to enhance dermatology access and melanoma screening in medically underserved populations. So we've already received a number of questions and you can keep submitting your questions. We maybe have time for one or two more by selecting the ask question tab below in the slide viewer. And you can also email us at questions at cmeoutfitters.com or tweet to, CME, or tweet to at cmeoutfitters. Um, so I have, uh, there are a couple more comments that came in when we start talking about the, the nail uh, 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 text. And so one person said it that, uh, melanoma in, this, in the nails is actually taught in nail tech school. Another dermatologist said that she gets a lot of referrals from hairdressers who are sending her scalp melanomas. Um, and one suggested that we get nail polish manufacturers to fund the research because that would be a great PR mechanism for them. Um, and then actually, interestingly, one person um, had asked about uh, how we can uh, talk to trainees about um, dealing with skin of color um, and screening for them. Um, she said that she has met medical students rotating through and how can she make sure that they're educated in identifying melanoma people of color and, and why is this, this more part of the curriculum and how can she discuss disparities with them? So questions about uh, teaching our trainees and, and in, in these areas, and maybe you can respond to that one. Sure, thank you for that question about uh, how we can train our students and, and residents and other trainees um, in detection of melanoma and even other uh, skin cancers and other conditions in patients with skin of color. The good news is that there are many broad-based efforts underway to expand the, the educational resources that would help uh, in this regard. Uh, most notably, the American Academy of Dermatology has uh, uh, educational modules that they've expanded recently and will continue to um, that are available for trainees and even practicing clinicians um, on various topics uh, in skin of color, uh, including uh, melanoma or skin cancer. Um, other, excuse me. Thank you. Um, so other, there are other entities. Uh, I don't uh, want to mention any specific names just in case of conflict of interest, but let's just say that there are other entities that have, uh, that are building big databases of images uh, that include skin of color and can be used for uh, teaching purposes. A great resource is the Skin of Color Society. The website for the Skin of Color Society does have a uh, a pull down list of, of educational resources that include um, that focus on skin of color. Um, so that's another source that you can direct your medical students and other trainees to to find le leading textbooks and resources that include skin of color. Excellent. Thank you again so much. Um, it's been a wonderful pleasure having you with us, Dr. Alexis. Thank you. Please join me here uh, at CME Outfitters for our upcoming brief cases and activities with more action steps against health disparities. In particular, two of our brief cases examine diversity and inclusivity in two important areas, maternal health and chronic pain. We will be adding new content every month and we really wanna hear from you, our audience, on what you need so we can make an impact on these very important issues. You can find out about all the upcoming uh, live events and view previous ones at the DNI Hub at the link here on your screen. Please remember to click credit for this activity um, by using the apply for credit button that you see here on your screen. 
And again, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Alexis, for your input today. Thank you to our audience for all of your hard work in providing equitable and holistic care to all of our patients around the globe. Have a good evening.